All right, welcome back, everyone. So my name is Shen Long from UIOC. I'm uh, the host for this afternoon session and also moderator for the panel discussions. So in the afternoon session, we are excited to have uh, uh, a, a few, you know, very exciting, you know, research talk, and uh, starting from uh, Dr. Jose Alvarez. Jose is a uh, senior research manager from NVIDIA. He leads the autonomous vehicle perception research team. His group's focus on, you know, scaling up uh, deep learning for autonomous vehicles, spanning efficient and data centric deep learning, 3D computer vision, and self uh, supervised learning. And uh, Jose's talk's title is Camera Based Perception for Autonomous Vehicle from Data Collections to Network Robustness. Uh, let's welcome Dr. Jose. Thank you. Thank you. In the, um, this. Well, thank you. Do you hear me well? Yeah, I guess so. Um, and is it visible now? Yes. Okay, yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks for the nice introduction. So Jose here, and as, as was said, um, I lead a applied research team at NVIDIA, where we are focused mostly on, on resource efficient uh, for AV. And in that setting, we have two, two branches, compute efficiency and data efficient deep learning. The team sits between fundamental research and, and the product itself. So it's quite exciting, exciting to be there to, to be able to transfer research results into, into product, which is the, the real challenge, right? Uh, today, I'm gonna talk about mostly two things, but I'm gonna share uh, some of the challenges that we are encountering. Uh, the title of the of the workshop is, is uh, New Tasks and Challenges. So I thought it would be nicer to, to see what, more than what we have done, what we are working on and what we think are then the next key uh, key um, challenge that we should be working on. In that space, I will touch quickly on the camera-based 3D perception, and then I will focus more on the data side and something on the uh, robustness of the, of the neural networks. About the uh, perception uh, pipeline, uh, I think for all of us, it's quite obvious that this is what we see these days in the car. We have multiple input images that go through one or multiple image encoders, and then we have this 2, 2D to 3D transformation with some encoder-decoder functions, and then some uh, representation of the, of the world. Uh, one example of this representation uh, is the, the outdated one that uh, cuboids plus uh, free space and any other thing that you can imagine. One key component there is the backbone, and that exists in in all the um, in all the applications that we can see. And obviously, the ultimate goal here is to obtain the best accuracy uh, under the minimum latency, the min min minimum memory, and and the min minimum power consumption that that we have. There's a trend to go into. Yep, yeah, sorry. There's a trend uh, to go from one backbone per, per task to go into a unified backbones. As we can see here, unifying the backbones usually incurs in some losses of, of the accuracy compared to the single task or a specialized backbones, but, but that's still a work in progress. The other thing is how to actually generate those backbones. And I'm not gonna go into detail, but, but we are very good at uh, generating very large models and, and, and models that perform extremely well, but those models cannot go into the car. So there's a lot of going on how to actually create this, these models. I will encourage you to, to attend. We will be giving a tutorial tomorrow, and also I will be giving a talk in the morning specialized on, on this, how to get the best of your hardware and how to go from extremely large models to the compact models that, that leverage the hardware that you have on the edge in the car. The key component on the perception, on the 3D uh, perception, is this 2D to 3D uh, transformation. And this can be basically the, the, the idea behind is you have 
points in the image and you want to find the correspondences in the 3D space. Uh, this can be done with a, with a forward projection. Basically, as, as the pipeline flow goes, you have points in the image and you try to find where do they correspond in the, in the 3D space. Usually with this forward projection, what we obtain is a very sparse uh, volume. Um, and the key component for this projection is, is understanding the depth. Uh, the, at the beginning, it was a non-parametric depth estimation uh, that, that was not particularly efficient. With M2VEB, we improved that, simplifying the, the uh, distribution of the depth. And, but we can do something more advanced, like uh, some parametric distributions that actually will lead to not only a depth um, distribution, but we could also compute uncertainty that can be very useful in this era of end-to-end -end learning to subsequent modules to give like how certain my model is of what they are detecting. A different way to do that is a backward projection. So we just start on the 3D uh, volume and we tried for each point in the 3D volume, we try to see which points in the 2D image do, do we need to get gather data from. The problem with that is that that doesn't scale well. So Siding was uh, talking this morning, and if you missed that, um, you can see that again tomorrow. Uh, what we can do actually is combine these two worlds and take the best of them because at the end of the day, they are complementary. And, and that was the uh, one of the key components that we used to, to win the uh, 3D occupancy challenge um, that was presented this morning. So I encourage you to, to have more um, insights of this approach uh, tomorrow as well. And with this, again, we, we won the challenge, and these are some video results of the uh, winning solution. So this is when it comes to uh, the, the pipeline with data, um, the 3D perception pipeline. And what I want to touch now more in detail is, is the data. As we all know, uh, data is the, is the fuel of the new uh, AI models. And it's well assumed that the more data we have, the better the model is. But at the same time, data is extremely expensive, right? Collecting data is expensive. Storing data is expensive. Labeling data is extremely expensive. And indirectly, um, when you st start scaling this and you have more and more data, the cost of training these models becomes infeasible, right? So at the end of the day, um, maybe we need to start considering not how much, uh, not giving more data, but how much data do we need? And what exact data do we need? And as you can see here, for instance, for ImageNet, if, if we select properly 80% of the data, we may get better results than just using more data. And we can see this is, is, can translate to other applications and, and in the end um, is very beneficial. So what we have been doing uh, in the past is trying to estimate if we, can, if we can make an estimation of how much data we actually need for a given problem. And it happens that we can use scaling laws uh, for these AI models. Uh, apparently, these AI models have three, three areas. Uh, one is the small data um, areas where the model is going to basically doesn't have enough data. So it's going to make a little bit of a random prediction. We have another um, section that is irreducible um, error region. Doesn't matter how much more data you put, there's some intrinsic errors in that data, and we're not going to be able to, min to keep minimizing the, the error. But what is interesting is that in the middle, there's an area where we can actually estimate, given a certain uh, um, accuracy target, how much data do we, do we actually need. The interesting part here is that that means that given an, a model that is performing in a small um, data regimes, like with a decent amount of data, but not gigantic amount of data, we can actually predict if we want to achieve certain uh, level of accuracy, how much more data we're going to need. And this interestingly translates, uh, is not only for classification, but translates to other uh, downstream tasks. One, there are two potential very interesting applications here. One is the idea of what happens if, for instance, in, in traffic sign classification, uh, we have a data set and now we want to add one more type of uh, traffic sign. 
how much data do we need of that new traffic sign? And that's, if you think about the entire in real world uh, data sets and the target was 80% accuracy. And as you can see here, uh, with, with the model actually trained on the data that we have, we can still predict how well we are going to do and how much data we are going to need of a, of a traffic sign that we still don't have. So in this case, we are using a model that was not even trained on that particular uh, traffic sign. A very interesting use case of this, uh, of this idea of predicting the amount of data is the idea of continuous error correction. So the, the, our models are getting more and more mature, right? So one thing that is going to be needed in the future is given errors that happen at test time while the people is driving, how can we quickly correct? How can we quickly add more data and correct that? So the key thing there is, can we avoid just dealing into, like going into a continuously long tail problem? If we don't, we, we're gonna be able to use clip or any other uh, image to uh, image retrieval methods to, to expand our data set. But if we don't add enough data, we are just expanding our long tail. So it's very interesting to, to actually estimate how much data we need to correct an error. And in the case of uh, autonomous driving, when we have fleets, we also expanded the framework to say what happens if instead of going with one single, one single time to collect data, we do that in cycles. So we can learn and then in subsequent um, iterations, try to understand at each iteration, how much data do we want, do we need to achieve a final goal at the end of the collection process. And what is very interesting as well is that we can expand the framework and use it to understand if we have different sources of data with different prices, how can we minimize the cost to achieve the accuracy that we want? And in this case, we can think of label data, human, human label data, unlabeled data, or any other source like uh, synthetic data. If we put this into this learn, optimize, and collect framework, basically we could make an estimation that will give us an idea of how much do we, do we actually need. Now that we know how much data, um, the next stage, and I, I guess we are all aware that, that labeling data is, is very expensive. As today, most of the um, the, the performance of the uh, of or AI methods is based on um, supervision, uh, human label supervision. So the next challenge is how can we reduce the cost? As you can see here in the graph, uh, the more data we have in general, the more uh, performance. But can we achieve the same performance reducing the number of unlabeled the number of labeled images? And one source, interesting source for this is, uh, can we leverage on label data? There's a lot of things going on with pre-training models, but can we actually do that uh, during training as well? So what we thought is, well, maybe we can use some sort of consistency learning, consistency-based learning. So at the same time, we are training with our um, label data set. We can use consistency in the training process uh, to, to leverage at the same time on label data. Then what do we do with human labels? That's very uh, costly, right? So ideally we want to use human labels only to label those things that are particularly difficult. And we can do that um, with things like um, selecting the frames. We can do that with active learning that are based on the uncertainty of the models. How can we go mine the data and understand where the model is going to learn the most? One key thing here is that all these uh, active learning methods, contrary to what we may think, need to be very efficient, right? What we need to do is traverse all the data that we have that is not labeled and make sure that we can select what data we're going to label next. Or in the ideal situation, we want to bring this into the car. And as we are driving, make sure that we can estimate uncertainty in real time and make decisions based on that. I'm not going to go into detail, but again, um, most of the uncertainty estimation methods are based on multiple models. And the problem with that 
is they don't really scale. So one of the challenges is how can we get calibrated uncertainty that can run in real time with a single model in a single forward pass. The challenge on, on selecting this is most of the uh, work out there is based on a single task, but we are moving to multitask and more complex um, prediction settings. So how can we move? How can we understand and do a, a joint prediction of what data do we need for the backbone, for the heads, and differently? And what is more interesting, at the end of the day, the data sets are going to last longer than, um, than the models. So if we are collecting data with one model today, how can we warranty that that data is going to be useful tomorrow or in a year time? So what we found um, some time ago is that actually if we collect data with a non so powerful model that's going to last longer than if we use the best performing model uh, for, for collecting, for understanding which data do we need to, to label. And then, if we only do, if we only append the expand our data set with, with very difficult examples, what we're going to need is what is going to happen is that we're going to shift the distribution, the training distribution is not going to represent or test distribution anymore. So one way to solve that is we can do self-learning self to maintain somehow the distribution. That will lead to different problems, like we will need to start work thinking of how can we prune the data set, because at the end of the day, if we do self-labeling, the amount of data we can self-label is much higher than that we can manually label. So that's something that we put together. And at the end of the day, what we found out is that combining these three things, self-label, um, leveraging on label data and human-based annotations, we can reduce significantly, at least for um, object detection, the costs in, in annotation. One quick thing here is we talk about annotation and in the 3D world, we are mostly using LIDAR for annotation, right? So one of the challenges that we experienced recently is that our data sets or the data sets that are publicly available, the range of annotations is very limited. But at the end of the day, if we are driving and we are driving with a long distance prediction, we need to actually annotate those objects that are far away. So how can we get that? Uh, the problem with the current LIDARs is that they are very sparse. So annotate, annotating that becomes very, very tricky. One thing that, that we can think about is, well, if given a cuboid and given the depth of that cuboid, we can predict uh, where in the image the 2D uh, bonding box is, maybe we can do the opposite. Given the 2D bonding box, which is very easy to annotate, maybe we can infer where in the 3D world that is. And if we iterate with this, we finally should be able to get some good annotations without um, even having the LiDAR points there. One thing that um, is also very interesting about data, and we talked about this before, is like now, how do we deal with the uh, um, long tail of the distribution? If we think about correcting errors all the time, what is going to happen is that the long tail is going to get longer and longer and longer, right? So one of the problems is that, or one of typical way to solve this is to replicate the data. When we think about objects itself, let's say for object detection, the problem is that usually those rare classes are attached to frequent classes. So if you just replicate data as such, what happens, as you can see here, is that the frequent classes get more replicated than the rare classes. So one solution that we thought is, how can we actually, get, is there any way that we can replicate only the objects? So we put this, this framework together that replicates objects itself and, rep, and uses uh, um, image sampling at, at the same time. And if we put the two things together, at the end of the day, what we get is a much richer um, training distribution that can overcome the, uh, the long tail problem. Last but not least, again, data is growing increasingly, right? And training is, 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 is complicated and it's very costly. So is there any way that we can just continuously leverage the data that we have without thinking of what data we had in the past? And if we can go one step beyond, the models also continuously change. So is there any way that with the model that I have today 
and the model I will have in the future, I can train my next model. So I will not go again in details, but on Wednesday, um, Danny will present uh, this idea of continual learning where we only, we don't change tasks, we, it's the same task. And what we do is leverage previous models and, uh, and new data just to keep moving forward and reduce costs. And at the end of the day, moving forward to a fixed training budget. So we don't have to continuously increase the amount of training that cost that we have. The, the last thing I wanna talk about is about network robustness that I think has been not, not, uh, been, not in the attention of many people, right? So when we talk about robustness, many people think about adversarial robustness and it's gonna be chaotic. But there's another source of robustness, and, and is this idea of what happens if this is more perturbation in the image? Are all networks robust enough? And those perturbations are going to happen all the time in real world settings, right? We can think about different acquisition conditions, noise in the uh, devices, many of those of those things. What we observe is that our models tend to be very sensitive to these variations, right? Um, on the top here, we see the performance of a 2D segmentation method and the performance goes down when we change a little bit the, uh, the, the image, but this gets drastically lower performance when we move to the 3D perception, right? So the fact that we have this 2, 2D to 3D transformation makes these models extremely sensitive to, to changes in the training distribution. So we started working on this idea of uh, this efficient transformer for semantic segmentation, where uh, we had a, a efficient self-attention module and then a very efficient decoder. And with this, we realized that it's not only very efficient at train time and it performs very well, but the robustness of this method, method was in, is extremely good, right? If we compare, back in the days to a top performing deep lab with the results of Secformer, out of the shelf was like extremely good. So there were a few questions that we asked ourselves. So why this is good, but why only um, 80%, right? So if, if we think about the retention ratio, we obtain an 82% retention ratio. That means that when we go out of distribution, we're still not good enough. So how can we, given the best Secformer model, how can we move this to much higher retention ratio? And we started analyzing why this is so robust. And we came with this fully attention networks that basically says that the, the, the attention mechanism is the key for the robustness. So if we work on that, and in this case, if we make all the modules uh, with this self-attention, we're going to increase the robustness uh, quite a lot. And we can see here some results that are available where how this is actually happening much better even compared to the previous sec format. This self-attention mechanism also allows other augmentation techniques that have helped us to go even beyond these fully attention networks and create something that is more robust, even more robust than the previous, the previous methods, right? Now, the next question was, this is a large model, but we still wanna go into the car, right? So what we observe is that big neural networks are robust, small neural networks are not so robust. Um, most of the methods, like let's say Secformer, we create a family of models and manually create a family of models, and then one of them may go into the, into the car. So the next question was, why compact models are not so robust and how can we make those compact models? How can we bring the robustness of these compact models, B0 in this case, up to the same as B5, the largest model? And in particular, the way we are approaching this is instead of manually um, tuning the architecture, what we want is to transfer the large network into a compact network. So we can do that through pruning. And again, tomorrow there will be um, a bunch of us talking specifically about this. And what is interesting is that if we think of pruning and robustness, they are somehow complementary 
uh, or like orthogonal um, goals, right? On the one hand, pruning is going to be specific to the data set. And what we found is that it's actually possible to do a joint optimization that is going to bring um, prune models, compact prune models, to increase their robustness. And that means that at inference time, when we deploy these models, they are going to be much, much more robust. There's one last thing about robustness and what happens when we, when we change the sensors. What happens if we change the car where we are deploying our models? Again, with 2D, that was a problem, but now when we move into the 3D and we think about um, the robustness of changes in the, in the sensor suite or the changes in deploying in one car or, or another, we observe that, that the, the accuracy drops significantly. This is extremely important because uh, when we think about deploying self-driving at a scale, what is gonna happen is that we're gonna have to deal with all the possible models that we have in the market, right? So how can we do this? We can go out there and collect as much data as we can with every new car, but as you can imagine, then we need to relabel again, and that's very, that's brute force, but not very cost effective. So one thing that we are considering is, well, can we actually generate that data? And if we are able to generate that data very precisely, then we can expand our data sets and use that data for training. And the key thing here is that we already put all effort to, to select what data do we need for training, what is the right data that we need to annotate. So everything comes for free, right? Only the, uh, the amount of um, the cost of generating the data. Yeah. So as a summary, um, I talk about three things. I talk about challenges on the camera, 3D camera-based perception, where there's a lot of things to do still on, on maximizing the trade-off between accuracy and minimizing the latency of, of the models. We think that starting with extremely large models and optimizing these models to be specific to the hardware is the key to move forward. One of the challenges is how to continuously improve this 2D to 3D transformer module. And then I went into the data space. And one thing that we need to keep in mind is that we don't need more data, we need the right data. And we need to make sure that we can leverage um, all the data that we have, even if it's labeled and labeled or even self annotated. And last but not least on the network robustness, we do believe that we need to start working or we need to continue working on the robustness of the network. If we manage to improve the robustness of the network, that also means that we can optimize the amount of data that we need to collect because we don't have to collect data on all possible scenarios. We only need to collect in one, make sure that the network is robust or we are able to generate data. And with that, in that manner, we will be able to, to create safer um, autonomous driving methods. Obviously, I didn't do this myself. It was a bunch of people, NVIDIAs working on this. So all the credit actually goes for them. Thank you. Thanks for short. And now we have all of our questions. Yeah, please come. I'm Chang from Cornell. Um, Correct me if I'm wrong. So you have a method that predicts how much data you have to collect for a certain accuracy. Mm -hmm. So like, is it conditional on certain active learning strategy or- That one is not. Just That right? one only says, assuming that all the data that we have is useful, mm -hmm. how are we- So it's just randomly yeah. pick something. Yeah. So I think the something. next step is, is, is now, how do you in, inject there the useful data itself? Yeah. I see, I see. Okay, another question. So- you were saying using pruning to actually sort of keep the robustness of the network. Um, 
is pruning a better strategy than distillation or do you consider distillation as part of the pruning strategy? For me, distillation, we will talk more tomorrow, right? For me, distillation is, is helpful as a, as a combined with pruning. So the way I see pruning, especially moving forward, is we have this extremely large model that is easy to uh, optimize. We can get extremely large accuracy. Mm -hmm. And now we need to compress like 80, 90% that model. It's going to be very difficult to maintain the accuracy. So with distillation, we're going to be able to, to lift that accuracy mm -hmm. and, and minimize the accuracy drop. So, so you're considering distillation as part of the pruning strategy? For me, that's that's part of the model optimization that comes after. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's all. Yeah. Thank you. Hello. Um, thank you for the presentation. Uh, what are your thoughts on, instead of optimizing the model to a particular hardware, what would be, what do you think about optimizing the model maybe for a like hardware agnostic? I would think that maybe the chip in the car in the future could, all, could also change. So what are your thoughts on that? So I, I didn't want to go into detail, but but this is a very good question actually. So, so academia, I think has done like, sensor uh, hardware agnostic optimization for a while. When, when you think from the industry point of view, what I want is something very efficient that given a new hardware, I can quickly adapt that my model to the new hardware. That's what I ultimately I want. So with model optimization, you, you have a generic large model and you have a, an efficient method to adapt quickly that model to the hardware. For me, that's the way to go. I understand that in the future, there's going to be new hardware, but at the end of the day, what I want is to get the best of my hardware today, right? So, so and, and doing uh, new architecture search or any other thing is extremely expensive. So what is a good method to given any, any algorithm, any uh, network, bring it to maximize your hardware today as fast as possible? And for me, pruning is the way to do that. Thank you. Um, so I have lots of questions um, in this type of work. But, um, so what was the um, range of um, the bird's eye view um, predictions? Because this whole thing, I'm assuming you're storing some kind of voxel grid to do the forward or backward projections, depending on the method and it's gonna very quickly gonna overwhelm the uh, compute device right? how far can you go into the well that's one of the problems right so so the, the voxel space is 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 one that is the main problem when it comes to the efficiency of the method because that volume is large you need to voxelize that and that that's a, you need to find a trade-off right. so that's why when you do forward, that's very efficient because you only scan on the on the source. When you do backward, that's not efficient. So combining these two, but but, but uh, there are some issues uh, that the forward method also has. You've got to collect, aggregate all the different cameras and uh, over because it's quite sparse, and you've got to pull them at. It's not. Uh, the, I mean, I don't know the details, uh, the range at. Uh, we are aiming like very far away um, and the, definitely the computer is a problem. I, I encourage you to to um, go tomorrow. The sitting will can, can give you more okay. specific details. You've got a, the height discretization would yeah. play a big role. In that's a, that's a definitely, a, that's, a, that's a problem. And also, have you considered um, doing augmentations in the BEV space itself? It's, is that something that we have um that i mean data augmentation is always a, a way to go right so it's a, always improve but there's this other ways that we can do hoping that augmentations then even boost further yeah thank you uh, thank you for your presentations and i think you are right you say the um the right model the the right data is a good learn more data. So um, how can we use the AI training the model? Because the, I think the camera uh, right now is more uh, efficiency. Yeah. So if, if we can use the camera plus the AI training, uh, will be 
better. So I, I think uh, how to get the right data, not for the more data. That's the, uh, the first question. Yeah. The so, second question is, uh, if you use this one, maybe we need a uh, low consumption and the uh, face the uh, computing chips. So how can we use uh, lighter chips to fulfill your AI training so, so I, I think, yeah, the camera is gonna be one way to go. And the, the numbers that we were showing are based on self-training somehow so it's just cameras so there's this long way to go i think on on leveraging cameras to train camera based models right so and then on the other hand we can use lidar and other methods to do the combination so i think that's possible um if you want to do that on the edge definitely that's a challenge because i mean you need to dedicate some compute to those models so the challenge is how to get something that is very um is efficient and you may not need to be so accurate as in the cloud because if you think about that um only saving let's say 40 percent of the collection is a huge saving so you can have something that is relaxed the, the accuracy is relaxed in the car when it comes to what data do i need and you do a second pass in the cloud that could be already very efficient and you could save a huge amount of storage um transmission and some other costs so i think that's that's for me that's a way to go yeah okay okay thank you thank you okay so we have a small team yeah thank you thank you